Section thirteen of Omega The Last Days of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Omega The Last Days of the World by Camille Flammarion. Part two. Chapter four. The last habitable regions of the globe were two wide valleys near the equator, the basins of dried up seas, valleys of slight depth, for the general level was almost absolutely uniform. No mountain peaks, ravines, or wild gorges, not a single wooded valley or precipice was to be seen. The world was one vast plain from which rivers and seas had gradually disappeared. But as the action of meteorological agents, rainfall and streams, had diminished in intensity with the loss of water, the last hollows of the sea bottom had not been entirely filled up, and shallow valleys remained, vestiges of the former structure of the globe in these a little ice and moisture were left but the circulation of water in the atmosphere had ceased and the rivers flowed in subterranean channels as in invisible veins as the atmosphere contained no aqueous vapour the sky was always cloudless and there was neither rain nor snow the sun less dazzling and less hot than formerly shone with the yellowish splendour of a topaz the colour of the sky was sea-green rather than blue the volume of the atmosphere had diminished considerably its oxygen and nitrogen had become in part fixed in metallic combinations as oxides and nitrides and its carbonic acid had slowly increased as vegetation deprived of water became more and more rare and absorbed an ever decreasing amount of this gas but the mass of the earth owing to the constant fall of meteorites bolides and uranolites had increased with time so that the atmosphere though considerably less in volume had retained its density and exerted nearly the same pressure strangely enough the snow and ice had diminished as the earth grew cold. The cause of this low temperature was the absence of water vapour from the atmosphere, which had decreased with the superficial area of the sea. As the water penetrated the interior of the earth and the general level became more uniform, first the depth and then the area of seas had been reduced. The invisible envelope of aqueous vapour had lost its protecting power, and the day came when the return of the heat received from the sun was no longer prevented. It was radiated into space as rapidly as it was received, as if it fell upon a mirror incapable of absorbing its rays. Such was the condition of the earth. The last representatives of the human race had survived all these physical transformations solely by virtue of its genius of invention and power of adaptation. Its last efforts had been directed toward extracting nutritious substances from the air, from subterranean water, and from plants, and replacing the vanished vapour of the air by buildings and roofs of glass. It was necessary at any cost to capture these solar rays and to prevent their radiation into space. It was easy to store up this heat in large quantities, for the sun shone unobscured by any cloud and the day was long, fifty-five hours. For a long time the efforts of architects had been solely directed towards this imprisonment of the sun's rays and the prevention of their dispersion during the fifty-five hours of the night. They had succeeded in accomplishing this by an ingenious arrangement of glass roofs, superimposed one upon the other, and by movable screens. 
all combustible material had long before been exhausted and even the hydrogen extracted from water was difficult to obtain the mean temperature in the open air during the daytime was not very low not falling below minus ten degrees at this point the author provides the following extended footnote many readers will regard this climate quite bearable inasmuch as in our own day regions may be cited whose mean temperature is much lower yet which are nevertheless habitable as for example Berkeyansk, whose mean annual temperature is minus nineteen point three degrees but in these regions there is a summer during which the ice melts and if in january the temperature falls to minus sixty degrees and even lower in july they enjoy a temperature of fifteen and twenty degrees above zero but at the stage which we have now reached in the history of the world this mean temperature of the equatorial zone was constant and it was impossible for ice ever to melt again End of footnote. notwithstanding the changes which the ages had wrought in vegetable life no species of plants could exist even in this equatorial zone as for the other latitudes they had been totally uninhabitable for thousands of years in spite of every effort made to live in them in the latitudes of paris nice rome naples algiers and tunis all protective atmospheric action had ceased and the oblique rays of the sun had proved insufficient to warm the soil which was frozen to a great depth like a veritable block of ice the world's population had gradually diminished from ten milliards to nine to eight and then to seven one half the surface of the globe being then habitable as the habitable zone became more and more restricted to the equator the population had still further diminished as had also the mean length of human life and the day came when only a few hundred millions remained scattered in groups along the equator and maintaining life only by the artifices of a laborious and scientific industry later still toward the end only two groups of a few hundred human beings were left occupying the last surviving centres of industry from all the rest of the globe the human race had slowly but inexorably disappeared dried up exhausted degenerated from century to century through the lack of an assimilable atmosphere and sufficient food its last remnants seemed to have lapsed back into barbarism vegetating like the eskimo of the north these two ancient centres of civilization themselves yielding to decay had survived only at the cost of a constant struggle between industrial genius and implacable nature even here between the tropics and the equator the two remaining groups of human beings which still contrived to exist in face of a thousand hardships which yearly became more insupportable did so only by subsisting so to speak on what their predecessors had left behind these two ocean valleys one of which was near the bottom of what is now the pacific ocean the other to the south of the present island of ceylon had formerly been the sites of two immense cities of glass iron and glass having been for a long time the materials chiefly employed in building construction they resembled vast winter gardens without upper stories with transparent ceilings of immense height here were to be found the last plants except those cultivated in the subterranean galleries leading to rivers flowing underground elsewhere the surface of the earth was a ruin 
and even here only the last vestiges of a vanished greatness were to be seen in the first of these ancient cities of glass the sole survivors were two old men and the grandson of one of them omegar who had seen his mother and sisters die one after the other of consumption and who now wandered in despair through these vast solitudes of these old men one had formerly been a philosopher and had consecrated his long life to the study of the history of perishing humanity the other was a physician who had in vain sought to save from consumption the last inhabitants of the world their bodies seemed wasted by anaemia rather than by age they were pale as spectres with long white beards and only their moral energy sustained them yet an instant against the decree of destiny but they could not struggle longer against this destiny and one day omegar found them stretched lifeless side by side from the dying hands of one fell the last history ever written the history of the final transformations of humanity written half a century before the second had died in his laboratory while endeavouring to keep in order the nourishment tubes automatically regulated by machinery propelled by solar engines the last servants long before developed by education from the simian race had succumbed many years before as had also the great majority of the animal species domesticated for the service of humanity horses dogs reindeers and certain large birds used in aerial service yet survived but so entirely changed that they bore no resemblance to their progenitors it was evident that the race was irrevocably doomed science had disappeared with scientists art with artists and the survivors lived only upon the past the heart knew no more hope the spirit no ambition the light was in the past the future was an eternal night all was over the glories of days gone by had forever vanished if in preceding centuries some traveller wandering in these solitudes thought he had rediscovered the sights of paris rome or the brilliant capitals which had succeeded them he was the victim of his own imagination for these sights had not existed for millions of years having been swept away by the waters of the sea vague traditions had floated down through the ages thanks to the printing press and the recorders of the great events of history but even these traditions were uncertain and often false for as to paris the annals of history contained only some references to a maritime paris of its existence as the capital of france for thousands of years there was no trace nor memory the names which to us seem immortal confucius plato mahomet alexander caesar charlemagne and napoleon had perished and were forgotten art had indeed preserved noble memories but these memories did not extend as far back as the infancy of humanity and reached only a few million years into the past omegar lingered in an ancient gallery of pictures bequeathed by former centuries and contemplated the great cities which had disappeared only one of these pictures related to what had once been europe and was a view of paris consisting of a promontory projecting into the sea crowned by an astronomical temple and gay with helicopterons circling above the lofty towers of its terraces immense ships were ploughing the sea this classic paris was the paris of the one hundred and seventieth century of the christian era corresponding to the one hundred and fifty-seventh of the astronomical era 
the Paris which existed immediately prior to the final submergence of the land. Even its name had changed, for words change like persons and things. Nearby, other pictures portrayed the great, but less ancient cities, which had risen in America, Australia, Asia, and afterwards upon the continents which had emerged from the ocean. And so this museum of the past recalled in succession the passing pomps of humanity down to the end. The end, the hour had struck on the timepiece of destiny. Omega knew the life of the world henceforth was in the past, that no future existed for it, and that the present even was vanishing like the dream of a moment. The last air of the human race felt the overwhelming sentiment of the vanity of things. Should he wait for some inconceivable miracle to save him from his fate? Should he bury his companions and share their tomb with them? Should he endeavour to prolong for a few days, a few weeks, a few years even, a solitary, useless and despairing existence? All day long he wandered through the vast and silent galleries, and at night abandoned himself to the drowsiness which oppressed him. All about him was dark, the darkness of the sepulchre. A sweet dream, however, stirred his slumbering thought, and surrounded his soul with a halo of an angelic brightness. Sleep brought him the illusion of life. He was no longer alone. A seductive image, which he had seen more than once before, stood before him, eyes caressing as the light of heaven, deep as the infinite, gazed upon him and attracted him. He was in a garden filled with the perfume of flowers. Birds sang in the nests amid the foliage. And in the distant landscape, framed in plants and flowers, were the vast ruins of dead cities. Then he saw a lake, on whose rippling surface two swans glided, bearing a cradle from which a new-born child stretched toward him its arms. Never had such a ray of light illuminated his soul. So deep was his emotion that he suddenly awoke, opened his eyes, and found confronting him only the sombre reality. Then a sadness more terrible even than any he had known filled his whole being. He could not find an instant of repose. He rose, went to his couch, and waited anxiously for the morning. He remembered his dream, but he did not believe in it. He felt, vaguely, that another human being existed somewhere. But his degenerate race had lost, in part, its psychic power, and perhaps, also, woman always exerts upon man an attraction more powerful than that which man exerts upon woman. When the day broke, when the last man saw the ruins of his ancient city standing out upon the sky of dawn, when he found himself alone with the two last dead, he realized, more than ever, his unavoidable destiny, and decided to terminate at once a life so hopelessly miserable. Going into the laboratory, he sought a bottle whose contents were well known to him, uncorked it, and carried it to his lips, to empty it at a draught. But, at the very moment the vial touched his lips, he felt a hand upon his arm. He turned suddenly. There was no one in the laboratory, and in the gallery he found only the two dead. End of chapter 4 Recording by Steve Chilvers, Norwich, England Section 14 of Omega the last days of the world. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in 
the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Omega, The Last Days of the World by Camille Flammarion Part 2, Chapter 5 in the ruins of the other equatorial city, occupying a once submerged valley south of the island of Ceylon, was a young girl whose mother and older sister had perished of consumption and cold, and who was now left alone, the last surviving member of the last family of the race. A few trees of northern species had been preserved under the spacious dome of glass, and beneath their scanty foliage holding the cold hands of her mother who had died the night before the young girl sat alone doomed to death in the very flower of her age the night was cold in the sky above the full moon shone like a golden torch but its yellow rays were as cold as the silver beams of the ancient Cellini. in the vast room reigned the stillness and solitude of death broken only by the young girl's breathing, which seemed to animate the silence with a semblance of life. She was not weeping. Her sixteen years contained more experience and knowledge than sixty years of the world's prime. She knew that she was the sole survivor of the last group of human beings, and that every happiness, every joy, and every hope had vanished forever. There was no present no future only solitude and silence the physical and moral impossibility of life and soon eternal sleep she thought of the women of bygone days of those who had lived the real life of humanity of lovers wives and mothers but to her red and tearless eyes appeared only images of death while beyond the walls of glass stretched a barren desert covered by the last ice and the last snow now her young heart beat violently in her breast till her slender hands could no longer compress its tumult and now life seemed arrested in her bosom and every respiration suspended if for a moment she fell asleep in her dreams she played again with her laughing and carefree sister while her mother sung in a pure and penetrating voice the beautiful inspirations of the last poets and she seemed to see once more the last fates of a brilliant society as if reflected from the surface of some distant mirror then on awakening these magic memories faded into the somber reality alone alone in the world and tomorrow death without having known life to struggle against this unavoidable fate was useless the decree of destiny was without appeal and there was nothing to do but to submit to await the inevitable end since without food or air organic life was impossible or else to anticipate death and deliver oneself at once from a joyless existence and a certain doom she passed into the bathroom where the warm water was still flowing although the appliances which art had designed to supply the wants of life were no longer in working order for the last remaining servants descendants of ancient simian species modified as the human race had been by the changing conditions of life had also succumbed to the insufficiency of water she plunged into the perfumed bath turned the key which regulated the supply of electricity derived from subterranean watercourses still unfrozen and for a moment seemed to forget the decree of destiny in the enjoyment of this refreshing rest had any indiscreet spectator beheld her as standing upon the bare skin before the large mirror she began to arrange the tresses of her long auburn hair he would have detected a smile upon her lips showing that for an instant she was oblivious of her dark future passing into another room she approached the apparatus which furnished the food of that time extracted from the water air and the plants and fruits automatically cultivated in the greenhouses it was still in working order like a clock which has been wound up for thousands of years the genius of man 
had been almost exclusively applied to the struggle with destiny the last remaining water had been forced to circulate in subterranean canals where also the solar heat had been stored the last animals had been trained to serve these machines and the nutritious properties of the last plants had been utilized to the utmost men had finally succeeded in living upon almost nothing so far as quantity was concerned every newly discovered form of food being completely assimilable cities have finally been built of glass open to the sun to which was conveyed every substance necessary to the synthesis of the food which replaced the products of nature but as time passed it became more and more difficult to obtain the necessaries of life the mine was at last exhausted matter had been conquered by intelligence but the day had come when intelligence itself was overmatched when every worker had died at his post and the earth's storehouse had been depleted unwilling to abandon this desperate struggle man had put forth every effort but he could not prevent the earth's absorption of water and the last resources of a science which seemed greater even than nature itself had been exhausted eva returned to the body of her mother and once more took the cold hands in her own the psychic faculties of the race in these its latter days had acquired as we have said transcendent powers and she thought for a moment to summon her mother from the tomb it seemed to her as if she must have one more approving glance one more counsel a single idea took possession of her so fascinating her that she even lost the desire to die she saw afar the soul which should respond to her own every man belonging to that company of which she was the last survivor had died before her birth women had outlived the sex once called strong in the pictures up on the walls of the great library in books engravings and statues she saw represented the great men of the city but she had never seen a living man and still dreaming strange and disquieting forms passed before her she was transported into an unknown and mysterious world into a new life and love did not seem to be yet wholly banished from the earth during the reign of cold all electrical communications between the two last cities left upon the earth had been interrupted their inhabitants could speak no more with each other see each other no more nor feel each other's presence yet she was as well acquainted with the ocean city as if she had seen it and when she fixed her eyes upon the great terrestrial globe suspended from the ceiling of the library and then closing them concentrating all her will and psychic power upon the object of her thoughts she acted at a distance as effectively though in a different way as in former days men had done when communicating with each other by electricity she called and felt that another heard and understood the preceding night she had transported herself to the ancient city in which omegar lived and had appeared to him for an instant in a dream that very morning she had witnessed his despairing act and by a supreme effort of the will had arrested his arm and now stretched in her chair beside the dead body of her mother heavy with sleep her solitary soul wandered in dreams above the ocean city seeking the companionship of the only mate left upon the earth and far away in that ocean city omegar heard her call slowly as in a dream he ascended the platform from which the airships used to take their flight yielding to a mysterious influence he obeyed the distant summons speeding toward the west the electric airship passed above the frozen regions of the tropics once the site of the pacific ocean polynesia malaysia and the sunda islands and stopped at the landing of the crystal palace the young girl startled from her dream by the traveller who fell from the air at her feet fled in terror to the farther end of the immense hall lifting the heavy curtains of skin which separated it from the library when the young man reached her side he stopped knelt 
and took her hand in his saying simply you called me i have come and then he added i have known you for a long time i knew that you existed i have often seen you you are the constant thought of my heart but i did not dare to come she bade him rise saying my friend i know that we are alone in the world and that we are about to die a will stronger than my own compelled me to call you it seemed as if it were the supreme desire of my mother supreme even in death see she sleeps thus since yesterday how long the night is the young man kneeling had taken the hand of the dead and they both stood there beside the funeral couch as if in prayer he leaned gently toward the young girl and their heads touched he let fall the hand of the dead eva shuddered no she said then suddenly he sprang to his feet in terror the dead woman had revived she had withdrawn the hand which he had taken in his own and had opened her eyes she made a movement looking at them i wake from a strange dream she said without seeming surprised at the presence of omegar behold my children my dream and she pointed to the planet jupiter shining with dazzling splendor in the sky and as they gazed upon the star to their astonished vision it appeared to approach them to grow larger to take the place of the frozen scene about them its immense seas were covered with ships aerial fleets cleaved the air the shores of its seas and the mouths of its great rivers were the scenes of a prodigious activity brilliant cities appeared peopled by moving multitudes neither the details of their habitations nor the forms of these new beings could be distinguished but one divined that there was a humanity quite different from ours living in the bosom of another nature having other senses at its disposal and one felt also that this vast world was incomparably superior to the earth behold where we shall be tomorrow said the dying woman we shall find there all the human race perfected and transformed jupiter has received the inheritance of the earth our world has accomplished its mission and life is over here below farewell she stretched out her arms to them they bent over her pale face and pressed a long kiss upon her forehead but they perceived that this forehead was cold as marble in spite of this strange awakening the dead woman had closed her eyes to open them no more end of chapter five Section 15 of Omega the last days of the world This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer Please visit LibriVox dot org Omega the last days of the world by Camille Flammarion part 2 chapter 6 It is sweet to live love atones for every loss in its joys all else is forgotten ineffable music of the heart thy divine melody fills the soul with an ecstasy of infinite happiness what illustrious historians have celebrated the heroes of the world's progress the glories of war the conquests of mind and of spirit yet after so many centuries of labor and struggle there remained only two palpitating hearts the kisses of two lovers all had perished except love and love the supreme sentiment endured shining like an inextinguishable beacon over the immense ocean of the vanished ages death they did not dream of it did they not suffice for each other what if the cold froze their very marrow did they not possess in their hearts a warmth which defied the cold of nature did not the sun still shine gloriously and was not the final doom of the world yet far distant 
Omegar bent every energy to the maintenance of the marvelous system which had been devised for the automatic extraction by chemical processes of the nutritive principles of the air, water, and plants, and in this he seemed to be successful. So in other days, after the fall of the Roman Empire, the barbarians had been seen to utilize during centuries the aqueducts, baths, and thermal springs, all the creations of the civilization of the Caesars, and to draw from a vanished industry the sources of their own strength. But one day, wonderful as it was, this system gave out. The subterranean waters themselves ceased to flow. The soil was frozen to a great depth. The rays of the sun still warmed the air within the glass-covered dwellings, but no plant could live longer. The supply of water was exhausted. The combined efforts of science and industry were impotent to give to the atmosphere the nutritive qualities possessed by those of other worlds, and the human organism constantly clamored for the regenerating principles, which, as we have seen, had been derived from the air, water, and plants. These sources were now exhausted. This last human pair struggled against these insurmountable obstacles and recognized the uselessness of further contest yet they were not resigned to death before knowing each other they had awaited it fearlessly now each wished to defend the other the beloved one against pitiless destiny the very idea of seeing omegar lying inanimate beside her filled eva with such anguish that she could not bear the thought and he too vainly longed to carry away his well-beloved from a world doomed to decay to fly with her to that brilliant jupiter which awaited them and not to abandon to the earth of the body he adored he thought that perhaps there still existed somewhere upon the earth a spot which had retained a little of that life-giving water without which existence was impossible and although already they were both almost without strength he formed the supreme resolution of setting out to seek for it. The electric air enough was still in working order. Forsaking the city, which was now only a tomb, the two last survivors of a vanished humanity abandoned these inhospitable regions and set out to seek some unknown oasis. The ancient kingdoms of the world passed under their feet. They saw the remains of great cities made illustrious by the splendors of civilization lying in ruins along the equator. The silence of death covered them all. Omega recognized the ancient city which he had recently left, but he knew that there also the supreme source of life was lacking, and they did not stop. They traversed thus in their solitary airship the regions which had witnessed the last stages of the life of humanity but death and silence and the frozen desert was everywhere no more fields no more vegetation the water courses were visible as on a map and it was evident that along their banks life had been prolonged but they were now dried up forever and when at times some motionless lake was distinguished in the lower level it was like a lake of stone for even at the equator the sun was powerless to melt the eternal ice a kind of bear with long fur was still to be seen wandering over the frozen earth seeking in the crevices of the rocks its scanty vegetable food from time to time also they descried a kind of penguin and sea cows walking upon the ice and large gray polar birds in awkward flight or alighting mournfully Nowhere was the sought-for oasis found. The earth was indeed dead. Night came. Not a cloud obscured the sky. A warmer current from the south had carried them over what was formerly Africa, now a frozen waste. The mechanism of the aeronef had ceased to work. Exhausted by cold rather than by hunger, they threw themselves upon the bearskins in the bottom of the car. Perceiving a ruin, they alighted. It was an immense quadrangular base, revealing traces of an enormous stone stairway. 
it was still possible to recognize one of the ancient egyptian pyramids which in the middle of the desert survived the civilization which it represented with all egypt nubia and abyssinia it had sunk below the level of the sea and had afterward emerged into the light and been restored in the heart of a new capital by a new civilization more brilliant than that of the thebes and of memphis and finally had been again abandoned to the desert it was the only remaining monument of the earlier life of humanity and owed its stability to its geometric form let us rest here said eva since we are doomed to die who indeed has escaped death let me die in peace in your arms they sought a corner of the ruin and sat down beside each other face to face with the silent desert the young girl cowered upon the ground pressing her husband in her arms still striving with all her might against the penetrating cold he drew her to his heart and warmed her with his kisses i love you and i am dying she said but no we will not die see that star which calls us at the same moment they heard behind them a slight noise issuing from the ancient tomb of cheops a noise like that the wind makes in the leaves shuddering they turned together in the direction whence the sound came a white shadow which seemed to be self-luminous for the night was already dark and there was no moon glided rather than walked toward them and stopped before their astonished eyes fear nothing it said i come to seek you no you shall not die no one has ever died time flows into eternity and eternity remains i was Kieps, king of egypt and i reigned over this country in the early days of the world as a slave i have since expiated my crimes in many existences and when at length my soul deserved immortality i lived upon neptune ganymede re titan saturn mars and other worlds as yet unknown to you jupiter is now my home in the days of humanity's greatness jupiter was not habitable for intelligent beings it was passing through the necessary stages of preparation now this immense world is the heir to all human achievement worlds succeed each other in time as in space all is eternal and merges into the divine confide in me and follow me and as the old pharaoh was still speaking they felt a delicious fluid penetrate their souls as sometimes the ear is filled with an exquisite melody a sense of calm and transcendent happiness flowed in their veins never in any dream in any ecstasy had they ever experienced such joy eva pressed omegar in her arms i love you she repeated her voice was only a breath he touched his lips to her already cold mouth and heard them murmur how i could have loved jupiter was shining majestically above them and in the glorious light of his rays their sight grew dim and their eyes gently closed the spectre rose into space and vanished and one to whom it is given to see not with the bodily eyes which perceive only material vibrations but with the eyes of the soul which perceive psychical vibrations might have seen two small flames shining side by side united by a common attraction and rising together with the phantom into the heavens end of chapter six in sixteen of omega the last days of the world this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org omega the last days of the world by camille flammarion epilogue and the angel lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever that there should be time no longer revelations ten six fie the earth was dead 
the other planets also had died one after the other the sun was extinguished but the stars still shone there were still suns and worlds in the measureless duration of eternity time an essentially relative conception is determined by each world and even in each world this conception is dependent upon the consciousness of the individual each world measures its own duration the year of the earth is not that of neptune the latter is one hundred sixty four times the former and yet is not longer relatively to the absolute there is no common measure between time and eternity in empty space there is no time no years no centuries only the possibility of a measurement of time which becomes real the moment a revolving world appears without some periodic motion no conception whatever of time is possible the earth no longer existed nor her celestial companion the little isle of mars nor the beautiful sphere of venus nor the colossal world of jupiter nor the strange universe of saturn which had lost its rings nor the slow-moving uranus and neptune not even the glorious sun in whose fecundating heat these mansions of the heavens had basked for so many centuries the sun was a dark ball the planets also and still this invisible system sped on in the glacial cold of starry space so far as life is concerned all these worlds were dead did not exist they survived their past history like the ruins of the dead cities of assyria which the archaeologist uncovers in the desert moving on their way in darkness through the invisible and the unknown no genius no magician could recall the vanished past when the earth floated bathed in light with its broad green fields waking to the morning sun its rivers winding like long serpents through the verdant meadows its woods alive with the songs of birds its forests filled with deep and mysterious shadows its seas heaving with the tides or roaring in the tempest its mountain slopes furrowed with rushing streams and cascades its gardens enameled with flowers its nests of birds and cradles of children and its toiling population whose activity had transformed it and who lived so joyously a life perpetuated by the delights of an endless love all this happiness seemed eternal what has become of those mornings and evenings of those flowers and those lovers of that light and perfume of those harmonies and joys of those beauties and dreams all is dead has disappeared in the darkness of night the world dead all the planets dead the sun extinguished the solar system annihilated time itself suspended time lapses into eternity but eternity remains and time is born again before the existence of the earth throughout an eternity suns and worlds existed peopled with beings like ourselves millions of years before the earth was they were the past of the universe has been as brilliant as the present the future will be as the past the present is of no importance in examining the past history of the earth we might go back to a time when our planet shone in space a veritable sun appearing as jupiter and saturn do now shrouded in a dense atmosphere charged with warm vapors and we might follow all its transformations down to the period of man we have seen that when its heat was entirely dissipated its waters absorbed the aqueous vapor of its atmosphere gone and this atmosphere itself more or less absorbed our planet must have presented the appearance of those great lunar deserts seen through the telescope with certain differences due to the actions of causes peculiar to the earth with its final geographical configurations its dried-up shores and watercourses a planetary corpse a dead and frozen world it still bears however within its bosom an unexpended energy 
that of its motion of translation about the sun an energy which transformed into heat by the sudden destruction of its motion would suffice to melt it and to reduce it in part to a state of vapor thus inaugurating a new epoch but for an instant only for if this motion of translation were destroyed the earth would fall into the sun and its independent existence would come to an end if suddenly arrested it would move in a straight line toward the sun with an increasing velocity and reach the sun in sixty-five days were its motion gradually arrested it would move in a spiral to be swallowed up at last in the central luminary the entire history of terrestrial life is before our eyes it has its commencement and its end and its duration however many of the centuries which compose it is preceded and followed by eternity is indeed but a single instant lost in eternity for a long time after the earth had ceased to be the abode of life the colossal worlds of jupiter and saturn passing more slowly from their solar to their planetary stage reigned in their turn among the planets with a splendor of a vitality incomparably superior to that of our earth but they also waxed old and descended into the night of the tomb Kai. Had the earth like Jupiter for example retained long enough the elements of life death would have come only with the extinction of the Sun But the length of the life of a world is proportional to its size and its elements of vitality the solar heat is due to two principal causes the condensation of the original nebula and the fall of meteorites according to the best established calculations of thermodynamics the former has produced a quantity of heat eighteen million times greater than that which the sun radiates yearly supposing the original nebula was cold which there is no reason to believe was the case it is therefore certain that the solar temperature produced by this condensation far exceeded the above if condensation continues the radiation of heat may go on for centuries without loss the heat emitted every second is equal to that which would result from the combustion of eleven quadrillions six hundred thousand milliards of tons of coal burning at once the earth intercepts only one five hundred millionth part of the radiant heat and this one five hundredth millionth suffices to maintain all terrestrial life of sixty seven millions of light and heat rays which the sun radiates into space only one is received and utilized by the planets well to maintain the source of heat it is only necessary that the rate of condensation should be such that the sun's diameter should decrease 77 meters a year or one kilometer in 13 years This contraction is so gradual that it would be wholly imperceptible 9,500 years would be required to reduce the diameter by one single second of arc Even if the Sun be actually in a gaseous state its temperature so far from growing less or even remaining stationary would increase by the very fact of contraction for if on the one hand the temperature of a gaseous body falls when it condenses on the other hand the heat generated by contraction is more than sufficient to prevent a fall in temperature and the amount of heat increases until a liquid state is reached the Sun seems to have reached this stage the condensation of the Sun whose density is only one-fourth that of the earth may thus of itself maintain for centuries at least for ten million years the light and heat of this brilliant star but we have just spoken of a second source of heat the fall of meteorites one hundred and forty six million meteorites fall upon the earth yearly a vastly greater number fall into the sun because of its greater attraction 
if their mass equals about the one hundredth part of the mass of the earth their fall would suffice to maintain the temperature not by their combustion for if the sun itself was being consumed it would not have lasted more than six thousand years but by the sudden transformation of the energy of motion into heat the velocity of impact being six hundred and fifty thousand meters per second so great is the solar attraction if the earth should fall into the sun it would make good for ninety-five years the actual loss of solar energy venus would make good this loss for eighty-four years mercury for seven mars for thirteen jupiter for thirty two thousand two hundred and fifty four saturn for nine thousand six hundred and fifty two uranus for one thousand six hundred and ten and neptune for one thousand eight hundred and ninety years that is to say the fall of all the planets into the sun would produce heat enough to maintain the present rate of expenditure for about forty six thousand years it is therefore certain that the fall of meteors greatly lengthens the life of the sun one thirty-third millionth of the solar mass added each year would compensate for the loss and half of this would be sufficient if we admit that condensation shares equally with the fall of meteorites in the maintenance of solar heat centuries would have to pass before any acceleration of the planet's velocities would be apparent owing to these two causes alone we may therefore admit a future for the sun of at least twenty million years and this period cannot but be increased by other unknown causes to say nothing of an encounter with a swarm of meteorites the sun therefore was the last living member of the system the last animated by the warmth of life but the sun also went out after having so long poured upon his celestial children his vivifying beams the black spots upon his surface increased in number and in extent his brilliant photosphere grew dull and his hitherto dazzling surface became congealed an enormous red ball took the place of the dazzling center of the vanished worlds for a long time this enormous star maintained a high surface temperature and a sort of phosphorescent atmosphere its virgin soil illumined by the light of the stars and by the electric influences which formed a kind of atmosphere gave birth to a marvelous flora to an unknown fauna to beings differing absolutely in organization from those who had succeeded each other upon the worlds of its system but for the sun also the end came and the hour sounded on the timepiece of destiny when the whole solar system was stricken from the book of life and one after another the stars each one of which is a sun a solar system shared the same fate and yet the universe continued to exist as it does today psi the science of mathematics tells us the solar system does not appear to possess at present more than the one four hundred and fifty fourth part of the transformable energy which it had in the nebulous state although this remainder constitutes a fund whose magnitude confounds our imagination it will also some day be exhausted later the transformation will be complete for the entire universe resulting in a general equilibrium of temperature and pressure energy will not then be susceptible of transformation this does not mean annihilation a word without meaning nor does it mean the absence of motion properly speaking since the same sum of energy will always exist in the form of atomic motion but the absence of all sensible motion of all differentiation the absolute uniformity of conditions that is to say absolute death such is the present statement of the science of mathematics experiment and observation prove that on the one hand the quantity of matter and on the other hand the quantity of energy also remains constant whatever the change in form or in position but they also show that the universe tends 
to a state of equilibrium a condition in which its heat will be uniformly distributed the heat of the sun and of all the stars seems to be due to the transformation of their initial energy of motion to molecular impacts the heat thus generated is being constantly radiated into space and this radiation will go on until every sun is cooled down to the temperature of space itself if we admit that the sciences of today mechanics physics and mathematics are trustworthy and that the laws which now control the operations of nature and of reason are permanent this must be the fate of the universe far from being eternal the earth on which we live has had a beginning in eternity a hundred million years a thousand million years or centuries are as a day there is an eternity behind us and before us and all apparent duration is but a point a scientific investigation of nature and acquaintance with its laws raises therefore the question already raised by the theologians whether plato zoroaster saint augustine st thomas aquinas or some young seminarist who has just taken orders what was god doing before the creation of the universe and what will he do after its end or under a less anthropomorphic form since god is unknowable what was the condition of the universe prior to the present order of things and what will it be after this order has passed away note that the question is the same whether we admit a personal god reasoning and acting toward a definite end or whether we deny the existence of any spiritual being and admit only the existence of indestructible atoms and forces representing an invariable sum of energy in the first case why should god an eternal and uncreated power remain inactive or having remained inactive satisfied with the absolute infinity of his nature which nothing could augment why did he change this state and create matter and force the theologian may reply because it was his good pleasure but philosophy is not satisfied with this change in the divine purpose in the second case since the origin of the present condition of things only dates back a certain time and since there can be no effect without a cause we have the right to ask what was the condition of things anterior to the formation of the present universe although energy is indestructible we certainly cannot deny the tendency toward its universal dissipation and this must lead to absolute repose and death for the conclusions of mathematics are irresistible nevertheless we do not concede this why because the universe is not a definite quantity omega it is impossible to conceive of a limit to the extension of matter limitless space the inexhaustible source of the transformation of potential energy into visible motion and thence into heat and other forces confronts us and not a simple finished piece of mechanism running like a clock and stopping forever the future of the universe is its past if the universe were to have had an end this end would have been reached long ago and we should not be here to study this problem it is because our conceptions are finite that things have a beginning and an end we cannot conceive of an absolutely endless series of transformations either in the future or in the past nor that an equally endless series of material combinations of planets suns sun systems milky ways stellar universes can succeed each other nevertheless the heavens are there to show us the infinite nor can we comprehend any better the infinity of space or of time yet it is impossible for us to conceive of a limit to either for our thought overleaps the limit and is impotent to conceive of bounds beyond which 
there is no space nor time one may travel forever in any direction without reaching a boundary and as soon as any one affirms that at a certain moment duration ceases we refuse our assent for we cannot confound time with the human measures of it these measures are relative and arbitrary but time itself exists like space independently of them suppress everything space and time would still remain and that is to say space which material things may occupy and the possibility of the succession of events if this were not so neither space nor time would be really measurable not even in thought since thought would not exist but it is impossible for the mind even to suppress either the one or the other strictly speaking it is neither space nor time that we are speaking of but infinity and eternity relative to which every measure however great is but a point we do not comprehend or conceive of infinite space or time because we are incapable of it but this incapacity does not invalidate the existence of the absolute in confessing that we do not comprehend infinity we feel it about us and that space as bounded by a wall or any barrier whatever is in itself an absurd idea and we are equally incapable of denying the possibility of the existence at some instant of time of a system of worlds whose motions would measure time without creating it do our clocks create time no they do but measure it in the presence of the absolute our measures of both time and space vanish but the absolute remains we live then in the infinite without doubting it for an instant the hand which holds this pen is composed of eternal and indestructible elements and the atoms which constituted it existed in the solar nebula whence our planet came and will exist forever your lungs breathe your brains think with matter and forces which acted millions of years ago and will act endlessly and this little globule which we inhabit floats not at the center of a limited universe but in the depth of infinity as truly as does the most distant star which the telescope can discover the best definition of the universe ever given to which there was nothing to add is pascal's a sphere whose center is everywhere and circumference nowhere it is this infinity which assures the eternity of the universe stars systems myriads milliards universes succeed each other without end in every direction we do not live near a center which does not exist and the earth like the farthest star lies in the fathomless infinite no bounds to space fly in thought in any direction with any velocity for months years centuries forever we shall meet with no limit approach no boundary we shall always remain in the vestibule of the infinite before us no bounds to time live in imagination through future ages add centuries to centuries epoch to epoch we shall never attain the end we shall always remain in the vestibule of the eternity which opens before us in our little sphere of terrestrial observation we see that through all the transformations of matter and motion the same quantity of each remains though under new forms living beings afford a perpetual illustration of this they are born they grow by appropriating substances from the world without and when they die they break up and restore to nature the elements of which they are composed but by a law whose action never ceases other bodies are constituted from these same elements every star may be likened to an organized being even as regards its internal heat a body is alive so long as respiration and the circulation of the blood makes it possible for the various organs to perform their functions 
when equilibrium and repose are reached death follows but after death all the substances of which the body was formed are wrought into other beings dissolution is the prelude to recreation analogy leads us to believe that the same is true of the cosmos nothing can be destroyed there is an incommensurable power which we are obliged to recognize as limitless in space and without beginning or end in time and this power is that which persists through all the changes in those sensible appearances under which the universe presents itself to us for this reason there will always be suns and worlds not like ours but still suns and worlds succeeding each other through all eternity and for us this visible universe can only be changing appearance of the absolute and eternal reality alpha it is in virtue of this transcendent law that long after the death of the earth of the giant planets and the central luminary while our old and darkened sun was still speeding through boundless space with its dead worlds on which terrestrial and planetary life had once engaged in the futile struggle for daily existence another extinct sun issuing from the depths of infinity collided obliquely with it and brought it to rest then in the vast night of space from the shock of these two mighty bodies was suddenly kindled a stupendous conflagration and an immense gaseous nebula was formed which trembled for an instant like a flaring flame and then sped on into regions unknown its temperature was several million degrees all which here below had been earth water air minerals plants atoms all which had constituted man his flesh his palpitating heart his flashing eye his armed hand his thinking brain his entrancing beauty the victor and the vanquished the executioner and his victim and those inferior souls still wearing the fetters of matter all were changed into fire and so were the worlds of mars venus jupiter saturn and the rest it was the resurrection of visible nature but those superior souls which had acquired immortality continue to live forever in the hierarchy of the invisible psychic universe the conscious existence of mankind had attained an ideal state mankind had passed by transmigration through the worlds to a new life with god and freed from the burdens of matter soared with an endless progress in eternal light the immense gaseous nebula which absorbed all former worlds thus transformed into vapor began to turn upon itself and in the zones of condensation of this primordial star mist new worlds were born as heretofore the earth was and so another universe began whose genesis some future moses and laplace would tell a new creation extraterrestrial superhuman inexhaustible resembling neither the earth nor mars nor saturn nor the sun and new humanities arose new civilizations new vanities another babylon another thebes another athens another rome another paris new palaces temples glories and loves and all these things possessed nothing of the earth whose very memory had passed away like a shadow and these universes passed away in their turn but infinite space remained peopled with worlds and stars and souls and suns and time went on forever for there can be neither end nor beginning end of epilogue and end of omega the last days of the world by camille flammarion